very glad to be back in Denmark. I try to come to Denmark at least once a year. I've been doing so for about 10 years. For many years, I was on an advisory committee here at the Danish Technical University, and I got to learn a lot about how the Danes approach technology and engineering, uh, and I keep coming back to learn more. Unfortunately, I don't speak Danish. My father's mother did, but uh, I'll be speaking in English, and uh, I know you all understand it better than I do. Uh, I also want to—I want to thank you for putting me in the in the in the time slot of death. We've heard about the chasm of death. This is the point in the program where everybody's had a little lunch and their brains are already saturated with interesting ideas. So I have the unenviable task of being exciting, interesting, and even more outrageous than our earlier speakers. I am going to continue to be optimistic. By nature, I am a, a cyber optimist. And I think in my field of information technology, we have lots of good reason to be so. I do have a number of different jobs. Uh, I've been teaching for the last four years at Georgetown University. Uh, and this is the most important slide of the whole deck, because at last count, there were 100,000 Mike Nelsons in America. If you want to find me, mnelson at pobox.com. How many of you tweet? I didn't think so. But if you need to find me and really want to find me, find me on Twitter at Mike Nelson. Uh, I also do have another job that I've been doing for the last two and a year and a half. I've been a research associate at the Leading Edge Forum, which is a small think tank within one of the largest computer corporations in the country. On Monday, I'll be announcing my new job, so uh, stay tuned. But I have an unusual background. My PhD is actually in geophysics and plate tectonics. I came to Washington for what I thought was going to be a one-year assignment to help Al Gore understand climate change, computers, biotech, Antarctica, and anything else scientific that he was working on. After a year, they discovered it was good to have a scientist in the Senate. I was the token scientist on the committee that was spending $20 billion a year on research. And as a result, they kept me, and I stayed there for five years before Vice President Gore moved to the White House, and I moved with him to work on internet issues and supercomputing. After doing that for five years, I spent a little bit of time on the regulatory side, and then spent 10 years, almost 10 years at IBM. And so I have this interesting combination of research, government, and, and, and business. So much of my job for 25 years has been helping these different fields understand each other, helping the policymakers understand science, helping the scientists and engineers understand what's happening in politics. Uh, I was also very involved in the Obama campaign. Uh, we had a team of about 400 people helping Senator Obama get smart about science and technology and mobilizing the, the uh, high-tech community. Um, my classes at Georgetown are, are a lot of fun. Uh, as I say, I've been teaching for more than four years. Uh, I've taught internet policy, e-government. Uh, next term, I'll be teaching a class on creating a culture of innovation. And I just finished teaching my most popular class, which is entitled How to Predict the Futures. And today, in 20 minutes, I'm going to give you the highlights of all four classes. <laughs> my students pay 200,000 Danish kroner to take those four classes. So you're getting a great deal. <laughs> I'm going to do this very, very concisely. In Washington, it used to be true that you needed a good bumper sticker. You had to summarize your idea in eight words. That's no longer true. Attention spans are now sh so short that you need one word. President Obama got to the White House because of two words change and hope. So today I'm going to give you some key words that you can use to explain what is going on with the cloud of things and how it's going to impact your business and your life. Uh, I'm also going to give you some reading assignments. I'm a professor. Uh, so through the course of this, you'll get a number of, of suggestions on where to go for more information. The first book I'd recommend is called Words That Work. Scientists and engineers are not famous for being good communicators. If you read this book, you will learn much better how to take the, con 
complicated concepts that we talk about and get them into phrases that you can communicate effectively. There's also a brand new book called Micro Style, The Art of Writing Little. If you ever want to tweet, if you ever do PowerPoint presentations, if you ever talk to a reporter, read that book. I'm not going to give you any tests today, and I won't be doing any, reading, any, uh, any grading, because I hate grading. But I will give you lots of reading assignments. Much of my job has been helping executives and ministers understand all this technology. If you're a CEO today, and if you were a CEO 20 years ago, you had to have vision, you had to have people skills, you had to have, understand products and marketing, and you had to have a, a basic understanding of finance. Today, all of those fields have a major component related to IT. So being an executive leader today, being a government minister, requires a better understanding of technology and how it's changing. So the first thing I want to do is, is, is give you some key words, and I'll give you some key numbers. In Washington, it's really helpful to have hundreds of pages of analysis, but it's really helpful to have two good factoids, preferably true. These are simple statistics that will stick in someone's brain, which they'll be able to use to make their point going forward. It's also helpful to have some stories. So I'm going to tell you a lot of stories today in the few minutes that I have. It's always good to remember that no father has ever put their child to bed and had the child look up and say, Daddy, tell me another PowerPoint. <laughs> stories are incredibly helpful. So I'm going to tell some stories about where we're going. As a futurist, I, th I found it's pretty easy to tell where the technology might take us in terms of the capabilities. How much faster will our networks be? How much more storage can we afford? It's even pretty easy to figure out what we might do with that new capacity. What gets hard is understanding the impacts that those new applications will have and how that will affect our society. I'm going to try to cover all four of those but the hardest part is that last part, and that last part is the most important part. How are we, we going to restructure our society? How are industries going to change? How is our personal life going to change? Frankly, we don't know, but we're going to guess. So what's next? What's the big picture here? In my field of information technology, I can say with confidence that we will see at least as much change in the next 10 years as we've seen in the last 20 years. So the pace of change is going to be at least twice as fast. Probably we'll see twice as much change. So four times that pace. Unless we screw things up. And I'll talk a lot about that. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a technological optimist, but I'm a political pessimist. And I'll tell you why. So the simple story here, we are entering the third phase of the internet. This is as important as the World Wide Web and we have two or three years to get the cloud of things right. To get the basic technology and standards right, and to get the policies right. And if we do, we're going to have an even more powerful platform today, which is tomorrow, than we have today, to address many of the problems we're fo focused on, whether it's health, environment, energy, uh, poverty. The other point I want to make is that we are really only 20% of the way through the internet revolution. And what's great is you can justify that in at least five different ways, lots of different metrics. So take everything you've already seen, all the changes you've already seen, and multiply by four, because there's that much more change coming. The cloud, of course, is the next phase. The cloud is the foundation that this next change is built on. The cloud really came into its own about three years ago. We know that because there was a front page article in the Wall Street Journal. That's sort of the, the, the threshold you have to cross to, to be important in the, in the US. It even had its own portrait on the front page. We all know about the cloud. It's been developing for more than 10 years, first in academia. We use it every day. Anybody who uses Gmail or uses any of tens of thousands of websites that run on the Amazon cloud, anyone who watches YouTube, you're all using data and software that lives on someone else's computer. It doesn't sit on your own computer. Just one cloud run by Akamai, which distributes web content, is responsible for about 20% of all the traffic on the internet. And it's just one big cloud, thousands of data centers all around the world. 
This is the third phase of computing. It is a fundamentally different way of doing computing, and it's about 10 times cheaper than the old way of doing computing. We've, we've, we've gone through three phases in the internet. The first phase was just about communicating, one to one, sending email from here to there. Then we had the World Wide Web, and now we had a way to broadcast content to the world. With the cloud, we have collaboration. We have the ability to have many-to-many -many communications, many people and many machines all working together. And that's a fundamental change, and it's driving a huge expansion in the amount of traffic. For those of you who have a historical interest, there's a, another great book called The Big Switch, and it compares the cloud to the development of electricity 100 years ago. A hundred years ago, every company had a vice president for electricity because you had to make your own. Then the electric utilities came in and provided a much more reliable way to get electricity. The cloud is doing the same thing for computing and storage. To put it in pictures, I call these CEO pictures. Very useful for reporters as well. Phase one was like this. All your data, all your software was on one machine in front of you. Then the web was born, I had a browser on my machine, and I could tap all the world's data through the web. What the cloud is, is what happens when you move the software and the data onto someone else's machines. And most importantly, it's what happens when you can tie together those different pieces. That's the fundamental magic of the cloud. I can take software in one place, combine it with data from somewhere else, I can store the results somewhere else and I can do it more cheaply and more reliably, and I can do it anywhere with any machine. That's the power of the cloud. What happens with the Internet of Things is that we get rid of the, we, we stop relying so much on the computer. Today, we have about two billion PCs and about half a billion smartphones that are accessing the, the, uh, the Internet. In just a few years, we're gonna have 100 billion devices connecting to the net and to the cloud. Every Dane will have at least a hundred different devices that they interact with that feed data and take data from the cloud. That means we're going to have to build much better wireless networks, much more ubiquitous. It means we're going to have a flood of new data. And that's why I like this term, the cloud of things. If you just talk about the internet of things, you end up focusing just on the network and the devices. If you talk about the cloud of things, you understand the power of putting those two things together, of taking those hundreds of billions of devices which are generating terabytes of information and analyzing it in a new way. The last talk we heard had a very simple sound bite, a very simple word. That word? Plastics. My word? Analytics. If you have an 18-year-old son or daughter trying to figure out their future, there are a few places better than analytics, big data. What are we going to do with all the information coming from the cloud? Already in the U.S., there's about 200,000 jobs waiting to be filled in this field of analytics, and the demand is just growing. So the cloud plus the Internet of Things will allow us to plug all sorts of devices Already, you take a picture, you load it to the cloud. Soon, these lights will be connected to the cloud, so we'll monitor energy use. Already, you can put your dog on the cloud. Yes, a couple days ago, Mary Meeker gave an amazing talk. Every year, Mary Meeker, who's one of the top technology analysts in the country, does her assessment of where the Internet is headed. And two days ago, she gave the best version she's ever given. She had... 20 ways the web and the internet will change everything. It even changes pet care. In the past, you lost your dog, you put up posters. Now you're not going to lose your dog. Because for $50, you can buy a GPS-enabled collar. It works for children, too. <laughs> I just bought some Ninja Blocks. Has anyone heard of Ninja Blocks? These are devices. One person, good. These are being made in Australia, and uh, they're, they're a prototype. I love the title here, Lego for Life. Um, there's a lot of Lego themes going around here. We all admire what, you, uh, what you've done here with that, with that company, and all of us grew up playing with Legos. Um, 
But what you can do with a, a ninja block, which has several different sensors on it, a camera, temperature, humidity, uh, you can just plug it into the net, and it will communicate with the ninja cloud. And what's neat about this device is you can just take the output, whether it's the video or the, or, or the temperature, and you can make it do things. So I can put it on the coffee table in my living room and have it taking pictures of my sofa. And if my dog jumps on the sofa, the ninja cloud will detect that. And if I set it upright, it will trigger another ninja block, which will turn on the stereo very loudly and scare my dog off the sofa. The next day, I can put the ninja block in my wine cellar, and I, can and I can detect if the temperature is the right temperature. The day after that, I can go put it on my, on my yard and, de and, and detect the temperature and whether I need to put the sprinkler on. This is sort of the cloud for lazy people. But it's just a, a plaything that allows us to make up all sorts of very powerful new ways of detecting what's going on around the world and changing our react uh, and, and doing things about it. Two days ago, another very important report came out, the Cisco Virtual Network Index. Every year, Cisco does a projection of how fast the internet is growing and where it's growing and why it's growing. The bottom line number, the factoid, in four years, we're gonna see four times as much traffic going over the internet. That's due to video, but it's also due to de devices. The biggest growth is going to be in mobile devices. In less than four years, we're going to see an 18-fold increase in the amount of traffic on the Internet due to mobile devices, including the Internet of Things. This is a chart from their the report. And as again, you see this amazing growth in tablets, in mobile devices, in things that aren't computers, because we are moving to this cloud of things. Science fiction is coming true. Everyone's going to be connected everywhere. There is this global brain. It's a little bit like The Matrix, if you've seen that movie. Uh, we have simulations, we have video, we're, we're building these simulations of what's going on in the real world because we can put sensors in the real world and then feed that into very detailed, three-dimensional worlds that we can go into. This matters for lots of reasons, and I can give an entire two-hour lecture on this. We're, we're obviously already using sensors to detect traffic flow. I spent half an hour in traffic yesterday here in Denmark. I wish you had some of this technology. Um, and I'm sure you're installing some of it. Public safety, detecting uh, national security risks, terrorism, but also just fighting crime. We have in some of the worst neighborhoods in American cities, we have uh, gunshot detectors, just microphones that can detect where a sound comes from. So the minute somebody, somebody fires a gun, there's a very uh, accurate location of where that gun was fired. And the police can be there within minutes, uh, and saving lives and often apprehending the, the, uh, the person who did the shooting. In agriculture, widely deploying sensors. Napa Valley has more sensors per acre than any other part of the world. Because wine is, can be very expensive if you carefully monitor the conditions under which it grows. And so it's worth spending thousands of dollars per acre if you can turn your $10 bottle of wine into a $100 bottle of wine by making very sure that the, the, the grapes are watered precisely and that there's not any wild variation in, in humidity. Environmental monitoring, home networks. Building networks in your home to control energy use can often cut 20, 30 percent of your energy use very, very easily. And one very exciting area is health care, and, and particularly care for the elderly. We see networks being built into homes that allow 80, 90-year-olds to stay at home when otherwise they would have to go into a, a nursing home because the sensors can monitor their daily habits, can detect if there is a problem, and can notify the doctor or the children if there's some, some, some th something needs to be done. I was thinking about this yesterday and, and realizing that it, when my daughter, who's 15, has kids and starts to tell her kids fairy tales, they're not going to understand, or at least some of the Grimm's fairy tales that I was taught, like Hansel and Gretel, 
about the two children who go off and get lost in the woods. Kids aren't going to get lost in the woods in 10 or 15 years. Same thing with Goldilocks. You know, what's with that? How can this little girl break and enter into a, the bear's house? I mean, most houses will be completely alarmed, and there'll be no way that the, the Goldilocks would get away with that. But of course, Hans Christian Andersen was right. There are still some, there are some things that will still apply. The emperor's new clothes still applies. Every time you hear about the cloud of things and the internet of things, you do have to say, is this for real? And there are problems. There are things that this will not solve, and there are things we need to be watchful for. There's a great book to read called The Promise and Peril of Big Data. It's about 60 pages. It's written by CEOs for CEOs. Excellent guide to some of the opportunities and the challenges that we have in dealing with all the, with the data explosion we're seeing. I just finished a report entitled Conceal or Reveal on how to develop a transparency strategy for your own company. What do you do with all the data that your company or your organization or your university is generating? And how do you share that with people who can use it? The big challenge here is not keeping up with the technology, which is moving faster and faster. We all know that the hardware and the software is way out front of the people. And that the people are way out front of the organization. The challenge is to keep that gap between the technology and the people from growing even larger than it already is. And so that's why I joined the faculty at Georgetown. My program is about communication, culture, and technology. We're looking at how technology is adopted by people and organizations, because that really is the, the rate-limiting step now. We've just heard two excellent talks about great technologies that are going to lead to better solutions in the future if people can use them. This is another book by the Aspen Institute called The Future of Work. And it's about some of the challenges we have in bringing technology like the Internet of Things and the cloud into the workplace. In this new world, we're going to have, I think, an opportunity to build much tighter communities. We're going to know much better what's going on around our, our, in, our, in our community. We're going to know where the best ideas are. We're going to be able to share those ideas, combine them in interesting ways because we're going to be able to collaborate online as effectively as, as we are in this room today. I was very glad this, this session is being webcast. I'm a little disappointed that only 12 people are watching it right now. But I've been in a lot of conferences like this where half the participants are online. And they're having a very lively discussion on Twitter, and their questions are brought into the room and are asked. This is a, a, a new way to build an online community that will as I said, get the best ideas from the best people and combine them. So let me make some quick predict predictions before I delve into politics and the depressing part of this talk. First prediction, within, 50, within five years, 80% of all computing and storage done worldwide will happen in the cloud. That's probably too audacious. It'll probably take 10 years. But that's still a radical shift and how all types of computing is done. Same thing, we could have 100 billion devices online in five years. It'll probably take 10. But there are estimates out there that it will take only four years to reach that point. Because many of these devices will be five cent, 10 cent devices. Why is it gonna take a little while? Well, we have to get technology, we have to get the standards, we have to get companies working together we have to get people to learn to move to this new technology of the cloud of things. And last, and most difficult, we have to have policies that don't stand in the way of progress. Policy is usually the rate limiting step. The technology is moving forward, the people are using it, but we have 20 or 30 year old government policy that stands in the way. For the last 25 years, I've been working on internet policy, and my main goal has been to make sure that we didn't let government regulation stand in the way. Lots of different issues will have to be assessed as we move to the cloud of things. We have to look at privacy issues, electronic surveillance and wiretapping. Certainly, we need to deal with online copyright issues and liability. If I build the cloud of things and some of my sensors don't work, as a result, somebody loses a lot of money, or even worse, lives are lost. Who's liable? Who gets sued? A lot of issues about international data flow, 
Can data collected in the Danish part of the cloud be moved to the Brazilian part of the cloud? If we make the right choices in this area, we'll continue to see this incredible growth in the internet. The cloud and the internet of things will grow even faster. We'll have the widespread wireless networks we need if we're really going to take advantage of the cloud of things. And this cloud of things will really almost become invisible. It'll be like electricity is today. I walk in this room and I assume there's electricity. The cloud of things will be as ubiquitous. If we blow it, if policy gets in the way, the internet and the cloud will become a lot like te cable television is in the United States, where in most places you don't have much choice. There's one or two companies that control what you can do, and that's it. So we have to get some things right. My biggest fear with the cloud of things is that we're not going to have a single cloud. Companies in different sectors are going to build different clouds using different technologies, and it's not going to link together. So the smart grid people in the energy sector, they'll build one type of cloud of things. The, the, the motor vehicle industry will do something different. Or worse yet, Volkswagen won't, won't work with BMW, which won't work with Ford. We'll end up with all these separate applications that can't share data. Almost as bad as it would be if we had those different technologies run by different companies and they were able to share the data, but they really didn't work together because they were built on different foundations. My hope and my dream as an optimist is that we'll have the blue skies scenario, the cloud of clouds. All these different devices will be able to communicate with each other just like the internet, a network of networks communicates with each other. But that's going to require Smart CEOs, smart policy people, and others. Am I all out of time, or do I have time for? Uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, OK. One, one minute. One minute, OK. Well, let me, ch let, let me finish with the last slide I have on the, on the three cultures of technology, the east coast of the US, the west coast of the uh, uh, and Brussels. <laughs> and I'm going to challenge you to pick the right approach here in Denmark. In the West Coast, our focus is on prototype, prototype, prototype. It's all about having fun, hacking, creating new innovations. And our motto on, in, in the Bay Area is, that which is possible is inevitable. In New York, the focus is on profit, getting lots of money and lots of power, often by suing the other guy or preventing your monopoly from ta being taken away. For that world, technology is often very threatening. And if you have a great monopoly with huge profit margins, it's usually the case that new technology is bad news. Brussels, I think, is even worse. They believe in the precautionary principle. Make sure nothing bad is going to happen. They focus a lot on rights, which is important. But they focus so much on making sure that everything doesn't change, that no one is disadvantaged that they miss the opportunity for innovation. And so they study, and they study, and they study. The Asians seem to be going the way of the West Coast. And Denmark, in the past, has been a place where prototyping has worked very well, whether it's Carlsberg or Lego. But you're going to have to keep pushing back against the impulse we see in other countries to make sure you understand the future before you build it. Saying it that way makes clear why that's a problem. So my last slide, just to reiterate, we're less than 20% of the way through this change. We have incredible opportunities. And when in doubt, empower the user. Give people new technologies to do new things, and we will find the solutions to the problems that we've heard this morning. And I think Denmark's going to be a great place to make it happen. Thank you very much for giving me three more minutes, and uh, look forward to talking. I guess we all would have wanted you to have 10 more minutes or 20 more minutes. Uh, anyway, um, I think we should allow a few comments or questions. So, yes, please. Yeah. 
that the forecast in Australia was that IT services would take up 20% of the energy consumption. Is the cloud designed so that in reality by work sharing that you can in, in a sense reduce energy consumption or what is the forecasting for that? The cloud will be much more efficient in terms of terabyte per kilowatt or calculation per kilowatt, but you're doing so much more of it. The, the, the real cost saving with the cloud is you don't have to spend so much time managing your systems and you don't have to throw away as much material. One of the problems we have with today's computers is you buy a laptop every two or three years, that's a lot of wasted material, there's a lot of, of stuff that could be recycled in there, the screen and things like that, but it's not. So the, the cloud is more efficient. The, the thing that, I, I'm surprised by that number, that, that is very high. In the United States, the total amount of power consumed for all computing is about 2%, and as we see this dramatic increase, we expect to go to about 4% in the future. But uh, I, I think we missed the point if we're focusing on that part of green IT. You know, that's 5%, maybe it's 20% for some reason in Australia, but let's look at the other 80, 90%. Look at all the cost savings we can get throughout the economy, and the cloud will drive some very impressive save cost savings. Not 5% not cost savings, but 50% cost savings and more. And one more here. We have uh, earlier used the word uh, trust. Could you please just uh, elaborate a little bit about uh, the trust factor in the cloud and are we moving towards a society where we can have the big blackout or the crime society? Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, how many people have ever had their hard drive crash? So you can admit it, yes, okay. That's one of the killer, the killer application of the cloud so far has been backing up all your, your data and people are trusting the cloud for that purpose. Uh, I, I think, though, you've put your finger on an incredibly important issue. If, if we don't believe that our data is safe in the cloud, if, we, if the cloud service companies can't show how they're protecting your data, then we're not going to make the move. But it's happening. Very few companies are not moving some of their applications and their data onto cloud service companies. But government policy is going to be really important here and we've seen some really stupid government policy already, and even state governments, regional governments, where they say, okay, this data can only stay in this jurisdiction, and, and they're missing the opportunity to put that data in a more secure place where it would be more easily stored. I, I, I think in the end, if you compare the cloud to perfection, nobody will ever make the move. But if you compare the cloud to what we have today, which is incredibly valuable data stored on laptops that get lost or stolen. Um, hundreds of millions of computers that have viruses on them. The biggest threat to our future, the digital future, it's grandma in Iowa. Grandma has viruses on her computer and her computer is part of a global virus machine that is attacking data systems every day. The cloud will get rid of a lot of those problems. But great question. I could give another hour lecture on trust and <laughs> privacy and transparency. We had a question down in this corner, please. I think that could turn down societies completely with uh, the <coughs> cloud structure where, where the whole society is so dependent on, on the existence of the cloud. Or what is your opinion? Well, that depends on whether you design the cloud where there's maybe a few dozen major data centers, or if you design the cloud where it's really a dispersed, decentralized process run by many different companies. I, I do have the nightmare that we're going to have two or three big companies that control everything. It'll be like a monoculture in agriculture all using the same software. I don't think that's going to happen. I think what's going to happen is you're going to have a lot of different companies running different cloud services interconnecting. And so I, I think that will be much more resilient than what we have today. The, the, the biggest challenge will still be the networks. If, if you attack the networks, then you can prevent people from getting to the cloud, even if the data center is working. Yeah, I was also thinking of, of superpowers fighting each other to turn down the others. Uh, a party that can completely stop one, one big nation. 
Yeah, I'm much more, much less worried about national governments doing that because they all understand how interconnected their economy is with the rest of the world. And frankly, a lot of superpowers know that the internet is a very effective way to get intelligence about their enemies. If they shut down the internet, they would lose that opportunity to collect intelligence. I'm much more worried about some crazy nihilistic terrorist who happens to have a PhD in computer science who's able to disable some of these major facilities. I think that's a bigger fear. But coming back, again, the cloud is being designed by the smartest, best paid engineers in the world. They're under huge pressure to make sure that their system works right. We have competition in that space. And there's also transparency. Google and Amazon have been very open when they do have a problem. So there's this feedback loop that forces them to make sure that they have redundant systems, that they have security built in. I think we're on a very positive slope in terms of cloud security. I'm much less optimistic about PCs and some of the devices that we plug into the cloud, but that's not as serious a problem. And then we have the last one now okay. here. Never take the last question. It's always the hardest one. <laughs> I'll try. Stay <laughs> Christensen. Uh, I think you really have indicated that we have uh, some serious choices to make, all of us. I have, uh, and I am not sure whether I am completely convinced that you are an optimist. <laughs> but uh, I have two questions. The first one is that um, uh, I have this uh, how you, this in innovation battle we are seeing, which is we are all in, inside. It seems that there are some segments like yourself working into the clouds. And there's a large other segment who's still standing with their feet on the ground. Could you give a little more advice on how we get you down on the ground, bringing us up to the skies, or the other way, how we, us on the ground, can go to follow you better? I think yeah. the two worlds are talking in two different languages, so we still may have a barrier of languages. Yeah. And the other question is, could you do a little more explanation on how we avoid the cloud drowning? That second one's the harder one. Um, I, I like the comment earlier in, in the talk about scientific drowning. I, I personally am dealing with that. The way I'm doing it, the way I deal with this flood of information is by using the cloud and using my social networks. I'm an avid user of Twitter, Facebook, and Google+. And for each one of them, I've identified different communities that are reading the same things that I care about. And they pick out what I need to read every day. So before I open the front page of the Washington Post or the New Wall Street Journal, before I go to any technical blogs to learn about developments, I turn and find out what the 100 people I most respect are reading. And they, they always, every day, there's two or three things that they teach me that I wouldn't have known otherwise. And they can filter. So I don't have to go to 55 blogs, my filtering folk. My network of filters is out there doing this for me. I do think we need to change the incentive structure. I, I think we, you know, we, we reward people way too much for writing way too many articles. We need to get the focus on quality. But uh, to your other point about how do we get people to move to the cloud, I think we just use the power of the demonstration effect. When big companies come out and show what they've been able to do in terms of the cost savings, when little companies find out what they've been able to do, using the cloud, I think that drives people very quickly. What's happening in many companies is it's not this, the chief information officer. Many chief information officers, CIOs, look at the cloud and they think, CIO, career is over. <laughs> sort of like the vice presidents of electricity. And so in many companies, it's actually the chief financial officer that's driving the, the, the move to the cloud. And the numbers are pretty compelling. So I, I think, I think, I, I think the, the trend's going to continue. It's happening whether you know it or not. Uh, there's a, a trend called consumerization or BYOT, bring your own technology, where employees who are frustrated with the technology their company or organization gives them bring their smartphone and their laptop with a cellular connection. And they start doing all their work outside of the IT system that they were given. And so there, that's the other reason I think the CIOs and the CFOs and the COOs and the CEOs are all starting to move to the cloud. 
Great, two great questions, though. And again, uh, you deserve a much longer answer. But, but that won't be possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much.